We have an expert in uh, liquid flows on space, uh, Dr. Mark Weislogel from the Portland State University in Oregon is the principal investigator for the uh, CFE experiment. Mark, uh, welcome to Mission Control Houston. Greetings from Portland. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us again. And uh, let's start off with the basics uh, of what you guys are working on with capillary flow on the space station. Well, currently we have a set of these handheld experiments. Um, it's, the acronym is CFE. And uh, they are performed by the astronauts on the, what's a, a, a movable workbench that's on the space station. And they configured this uh, container up and set up lighting and cameras and talked to us on the ground. And they deploy a fluid into a strange um, container shape where the geometry of the container interacts with the surface tension and wetting properties of the fluid to make the liquid go where we want them to go. And this is an important aspect of um, designs for fluid systems on spacecraft because you can make the container basically pump the liquid where you want them to be. And, and what we're trying to do is develop a theoretical basis to use such forces to replicate fluid behavior in space, just like it would happen on ground, but you're replacing the uh, impact of gravity with that of surface tension. And so engineers could be much more familiar with systems and make them more reliable. Mark, you, you called it weird shapes that you were putting these fluids through when we talked earlier this week. Can you tell me a little bit about how these shapes are designed and, and what, what you're trying to find out there? Yes, the, the shapes actually arise from mathematical relationships. So we, we identified a fa these different families of geometries that make the fluid do different things at different rates. And so we, we, they have different names. They're tapered triangular vessels or tapered rectangular vessels or uh, uh, cylinders with vein structures that taper or, you know, strange teardrop-shaped sections, these kind of things. And so um, what you're used to seeing, you know, like cylindrical tubes or spherical tanks, you know, start to look more like uh, the innards of a, a body digestive system. You know, the, the new shapes are kind of strange. Um, but it gets these really neat results of uh, passive manipulation of large amounts of liquid in space. And, and why do we have such a problem with that? Well, if the problem is that you can have multiple, okay, if you have a, a container uh, in low gravity, the liquid could be located in various places within the container. It would be nice to design shapes that there's only one possible place that the fluid could be, and it's where you want it to be. That's, and that's what we're after. Um, the nature of the, the mathematics that governs this stuff is that you have multiple um, solutions, many different solutions. So um, we're trying to make that a lot easier. And I would imagine that this would probably help uh, in the development of systems that uh, could rely on natural flows instead of hard to maintain pumping systems. Exactly. So we would like to get away from the added complexity of uh, centrifugal, you know, pumping or separations and uh, that require orbital maneuvers or even spinning the spacecraft, things like that, and greatly simplify things so that the, the fluid just always goes to where you want it to go so that the center of gravity of it is known. You know, all of these, uh, all of these things are known. That would be great. And also, excuse me, also it would be good if even if you do use a, such, such a thing as a centrifugal method, if there's ever a failure, you have this backup passive means of still being able to, to uh, hobble along functioning, maybe at a reduced level, but you'll still function with no moving parts in a passive manner. So it's a nice redundant system as well for, um, for systems that already use something like a centrifuge. And we're already using some of this capillary flow on the space station, right? Yes, that's true. And systems like the cooling system, uh, particularly outside with, with the ammonia that's used to help get rid of excess heat. Uh, yes, that's, but that's designed to be, um, I believe that's a, is that a single, is that a single phase? I can't remember, recall what, if that's a single or, or a two-phase system. I think it's a single-phase system. So in, it, not always do we rely on surface tension, but in some manner it still winds up rearing its head and can either bite us or we can exploit it. So there's... Um, we still we must understand this to to uh, uh, make r systems reliable that we can uh, that we can count on their performance. And as I recall, you have a student team that's involved in doing this work too, right? Yes. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, how many students you have working with you oh. and and the learning experiences provides? 
Yes, this this is the probably the greatest greatest part of this work is uh, yes we have um I have uh, three students uh, currently now working on on this net, this particular uh, project, and these students have been involved in training astronauts and helping develop the crew procedures to actually talking with the astronauts during the operations. One of those students, who's now a PhD student at Portland State, Will Blackmore, has completed over ten. Um, uh, uh, sessions with the discussing with the astronauts during the experiments. This is through a control station that NASA allowed us to set up at our campus. This experience is is really something. He's very good at it too, and I rely on him a lot to take take some of the pressure off me because it's it's um it's intimidating if you ask me, especially when you're excited about the experiment and the things that can go wrong and the possibility of getting the data in just moments. Oh, it's very exciting. And you told me earlier this week that you all have been on a, a, a different sleep schedule because the space station operates generally on Greenwich Mean Time, which means they get up at midnight central time here in Houston, and you're two hours earlier out in there in Portland. How's that been working out for you? It it works out, and we've gotten used to it. But when we bring new people onto the team, they they uh, can experience difficulties. I think we've had ten all-nighters, you know, already, you know, just uh, just in the last few months, and so so it's something to try to live a normal day, working pretty hard, and then all of a sudden, you know, here goes uh, an all-nighter. But um, a little caffeine and the enthusiasm keeps us going. Have you seen anything that surprised you on uh, CFE three so far? Oh yes, um, we we on um, we do not anticipate this. So, uh, but we are com we're growing to expect, you know, some very some uh, uh, well, you could call them discoveries, some new new things that we didn't imagine. Like when the astronauts will manipulate the test cell in ways that oh we we learn on the spot that we can do something different and get new data, better data, more data, and in some cases we see fluid doing things that we don't expect at rates we didn't anticipate and. Those are the ones we scratch our heads, and, and sometimes we say, oh, we should have thought of that, but sometimes we say, oh, that's, that's new. Let's go after that. So, so, it, so what we discover can change what we discover. But in, in it, fortunately for us in our cases, it's always been expansive, so everything that we've uh, observed improves our, our science to a high degree. It's been great. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark. Uh, I know it's all about the math, but give us a little background of your education and where you're from so that uh, we can uh, help folks uh, identify with uh, the real people involved in the experiment in space. Okay, well, I was a, uh, a pretty much a snoozer in high school, but I uh, got turned on in college to fluid mechanics at uh, Washington State University, where I got both undergraduate and master's degrees. And that's when I first saw microgravity fluid mechanics, and um, that really changed things for me. I uh, wound up getting a Ph.D. at Northwestern University and working at NASA Glenn Research Center for 10 years, and that, that's where I uh, got fascinated with uh, microgravity work. Um, since, since then, have come to Portland State University, where we just recently built a drop tower in support of the microgravity work, and, and it has really been a, a, just a series of discoveries and novelties and uh, developing the science. And now, now we're into this application mode where we're applying things to systems on the ground, you know, microfluidic systems, um, from something as simple as candle flame wicks, you know, structures to, um, to actual processing of blood samples, things like that, and uh, as well as applying our work to developing better systems for spacecraft, too. So we are, I mean, we're really enjoying this. Well, Mark Wiselogo from uh, Portland State University, I want to thank you again for being with us here today to talk about uh, Capillary Flow Experiment 3, and we look forward to seeing the benefits of your work uh, in the everyday things that we use here on Earth. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thanks again, Mark. Okay, see ya.